And today's video is going to be a leg workout that I did recently. And this is a bodybuilding focus. The main purpose of the leg workout is to build and thicken the thighs, but to maintain a narrow midsection. So I'm starting here with leg extensions, and I'm actually rotating through my hips. You can see my hands are on my hips. I'm actually rotating my thighs inward. My toes are pointed in, and that's going to help me focus on hitting the outer quads. Now, I'll typically do this with warm-up sets. So you can see there I'm moving my shorts around, kind of getting a feel uh, where I want my fingertips on, where I want the muscle to contract. So that is a great way to build up mind-muscle connection during the warm-ups is sometimes playing with your foot positions. If you were to roll your thigh outward and toes point out, you would hit kind of that teardrop area. But the inward angle hits the quad sweep. Now in our machine, this is a Strive leg extension, but Prime Fitness also makes the same uh, model now. But the plate on the top peg makes it so that it's heaviest at the bottom, but a little bit lighter at the top. So at the bottom, when my quads are most stretched, that'll actually activate that outer quad sweep the most. And then as you get up towards the top, that's when the teardrop, the inside part of the quadricep takes over. So by being able to change the weight load to emphasize more of the bottom part of the range of motion, along with angling my toes inward by rotating through my hips, rotating my thighs inward, this is a really good way to get extra attention on the quad sweep. So if you want to build your quad sweep, you can do this as well. I typically would do this during the warm-ups, and then on the regular working sets, I kind of straighten everything out, and I hold myself in the seat, and I go for maximum performance and balance across the muscles. But this is a great technique to use on lighter weights and or warm-ups. So you can see here, I'm going to add a little more weight and get into another set. So typically, I'll do two or three uh, warm-up sets. And then on today's workout, I end up aiming for three working sets. So the warm-up sets, the idea is just, again, kind of getting your mind connected with the muscles you want and understanding kind of what the position feels like that day, the weight feels like that day, just giving yourself a chance to be mentally connected with the movement. So now that I'm getting a little heavier, my hands go in the handles to hold my butt down in the seat. <laughs> and then I'm straightening out my thighs, straightening out my feet. Now, the technique that I'm using today is multiple rest pauses. So I do 10 reps, and then I'm going to take about five deep breaths. And then I'll do another five reps, another five breaths, and then another five reps. So 10, five, five. So 20 reps total. Now, that's a really good way to pump a lot of blood in a lot of the higher end of volume uh, stress into the tissue. So it kind of depends on what I'm doing the rest of the workout. If I have other quadricep-based things and they're heavy, then I'll make this uh, more of a high rep stuff. If the other quadricep things are high reps, then I might go a little heavier on this. The idea is to kind of blend it all together. Okay, so what you would have seen on the warm-up sets, I like to kind of roll my thighs inward and use my fingers and actually touch kind of on the outside of the thigh. So that helps me feel more engaged with the sweep of the quads. During the warm-ups, when it's lighter, you're building that mind-muscle connection, and since it's light enough, you don't have to like pull yourself into the seat yet. So on my warm-ups, I like to roll my thighs from the hips, actually roll them inward, point my toes in, and touch the outside of my thighs. Then when I get to the working sets, it's heavier, it's also more painful, so I go ahead and hold into the handles on the seat, leave my feet kind of straight, use the full quad, but now that I've sensitized and kind of pre-exhausted that outside, it helps to get a little bit more growth in that area, even on the working, heavy working sets whenever I keep everything neutral and I'm holding this. So that's one of the ways I like to use kind of the warm-up sets compared to the working sets. Okay, so you can hear me kind of explain everything there. So going back for another working set. And with these, I am trying to get a full contraction at the top. So that is helpful to get maximal muscle stress is making sure that at the top you fully contract. I do sometimes do partials as well, but I would be intentionally doing the partials rather than thinking I'm doing full rain <laughs> and only doing partials. But this uh, benefit of hanging out and having that pause there, it actually makes it more frustrating on the muscles because you don't get a chance to kind of flush the fluids out and you're restarting whenever they think they were done. So the rests 
although it seems like that's making it easier, it's actually more painful. So it's a fantastic technique. You can see me kind of grimacing there. It's a great technique to get a lot of stress into the tissues. And over time, instead of doing 10, 5, 5, maybe I could do, you know, 12, 5, 3, then 14, you know, 4 and 2. The, it gives you room to progress by being able to either add repetitions per section or you can add weight if you want. So sometimes I might do, say, a 12, 6, 6, add 10 pounds next week, do 10, 4, 4, add 10 pounds, do 8, 2, 2. So there's a lot of ways you can progress either in weight load or maintain the same weight and play around with different rep ranges. The idea is just every time you repeat the movement, you want to try to increase the stress that you felt from the movement in some way. So that way the body continues to increase its adaptations by building new tissue, building more endurance, uh, better recovery systems, uh, whatever the type of stimulus you're providing to the body, whether it's, you know, strength-based, size-based, endurance-based, whatever it might be, uh, whatever the stimulus is, your body continues to adapt to it. Now, of course, that is tied in with nutrition, especially for muscle growth. So you have to make sure your calories are on point. You have to make sure you're getting enough protein. Uh, and that's all a little bit variable per person. On our podcast, I'll tell you here in a second. Okay, so that was awful, but really effective. So you can see there the technique I was using for leg extensions was... 10 reps, 5 breaths, 5 reps, 5 breaths, 5 reps. So instead of 20, but you do 10, 5, 5 divided by 5 breaths. What I would do for progression for that is kind of give or take. If I'm going to push volume, I'll try the same weight, maybe do, you know, 11, 6, 6. The next week do 12, 7, 7. I usually keep things for 4 weeks at most. If I want to push weight, then maybe I'll just add 10 pounds, try to still do 10, 5, 5. I just play with it a little bit, so each week I either add weight or I add volume, which is total repetitions with the same weight. It really depends on what else I'm doing in the workout. If I have other things that are going to be adding weight, I do volume on this and vice versa. But that was the technique for this exercise. Uh, it's kind of like multiple rest pauses. So 10, 5 breaths, 5 reps, 5 breaths, 5 reps. Awesome. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, we do have a podcast about nutrition, how to rate your own nutrition programs. Uh, it's podcast 1,232. You can find that on our website at www.brutalironjim.com. And then we do have our like nutrition coaching service where I actually tell you how many calories and protein to go for and then help you with daily decisions on foods and timing and blending that into your schedule. So we have all of that available on our website, www.brutalironjim.com. Now here you can see I moved on to hamstrings. And this, again, is following the pattern of wanting to build the thighs without building up the midsection thickness. So by doing the quadriceps isolative and then the hamstrings isolative, you're going to pre-exhaust those tissues. And then any kind of more bigger, compound, heavier loaded movement doesn't need to be as heavy to damage the tissues. So therefore, it lessens the strain on the abdominal bracing. So if you're going to do squats, for example, it's better to pre-exhaust the quadriceps and hamstrings before you go do squats. So that way you don't need as much weight on the squats, it doesn't stress the lower back, doesn't thicken the core as much, but you still get maximum growth of the thighs. So my technique here, I'm doing single leg and I'm doing a drop set. So I had a weight on there, I think I did 5 reps at 50 pounds, and then I dropped to 40, and then I'm dropping to 30. And going back and forth, it gives my each leg like a small little rest. So it's kind of almost like a blended in uh, rest pause built into the drop set. So really fun variation. Okay, so I think for our hamstring curls today, I'm going to do sets of five, but actually do a drop set. So I'll do single leg. I'll do five reps, drop maybe 10 pounds, try another three to five, drop 10 pounds, another three to five. And then I'll do that for three working sets. And then maybe next week... Keep the same weight, try to add reps. So with hamstrings, I like doing some mixture of heavy weights as well as high volume. So for my big exercises today in leg press, I plan on doing really high reps. So I'll keep it heavier when I'm doing the hamstring isolations today. Okay, so that gives me a good contrast to the leg press volume. Okay, let's go. Okay, so I'm jumping back in. And uh, again, like I was, I was saying, this is a fun variation. I do sometimes do straight sets where I just do like a set of, you know, 10 reps, then take a long break, set of 10 reps, take a long break. 
But I typically don't do that when I do isolative work because since when you're doing isolative work, you can't use a lot of weight load, it's harder and more challenging to get a significant degree of stress into the tissues. So therefore, intensity techniques such as rest, pause, drop sets, and there's you know dozens of others, they are very helpful to do when doing isolative work uh, because it helps to create that extra stress, that extra damage, even though you're lighter in weight load. So you're lighter in weight load to protect the joints because when you're doing isolative work, you know, a single joint is more uh, at risk. It's it's more uh, isolated in its stress load as well. So if you can do something that makes isolated work more stressful than normal straight sets, since the weight load is lower, that's a really good idea. And then you'll see here later in the workout, I'm going to be going to leg press and just doing some straight sets, no special techniques. And that's because leg press is super freaking heavy. <laughs> so by having the ability to use heavy weight on that movement, you don't need as much uh, tech special techniques. So too often people, you know, if you if you don't know when and where to use the techniques, you can either underutilize them or actually overdo it and cause joint stress and overall nervous system fatigue. But typically a good kind of general rule of thumb could be when you're doing isolative, lighter weighted movements, intensity techniques are probably a good idea. When you're doing heavy weighted movements, it's probably better to not have intensity techniques and focus more so on the quality of what you're doing. So that way you can keep yourself safe and you can maximize muscle recruitment within that heavier movement and let the heavy weight be the thing that's causing the stress in order to elicit change in growth within the tissues. Cool. Now with this movement, um, the main thing I like to do with hamstring curls is just to make sure I always stay under control. So on the eccentric portion, the lowering portion under the weight load, I'm controlling it and making sure that the weight stack doesn't touch. I want to maintain constant tension on the muscle. So I do move relatively quickly in just my general movement speed for um, uh, bodybuilding work, but I'm always under control. So at any point, if somebody sounds stop, I'd be able to stop exactly where I was. And that's a good kind of self-test to know if you have uh, the right amount of control with bodybuilding work, is you don't want momentum to be involved. You want the muscle to be under strained load throughout the entire range of motion, so you get all of the fibers within the range of motion damaged to grow. So... That's a good rule of thumb is if at any point somebody yelled stop, you'd be able to stop exactly where you were. If you feel like you had to like, you know, catch the weight before you could stop, then you're probably too much momentum. Now, there's a balance. Every once in a while you try, you know, a new weight PR or a new weight progression and maybe it, it requires a little momentum. But you do want to come back and try to clean that up and do it without momentum before you would try to make the next weight load based progression. Okay, two sets in, everything's feeling good and crampy, so we'll catch the third set now. Okay, so I'm hitting up my, uh, I think this is my last working set here. So again, good control, lots of volume in, and today's workout I did, like I said, about two or three warm-ups, and then I was doing three working sets for these movements. And that's a pretty good volume. I find that if I only do one or two working sets, I don't know if I fully exhausted the fibers, you know, in that position with that exact stress. But yet, if I'm doing four or five sets, uh, you wonder if you know, have been sandbagging and maybe not fully uh, maximizing those first couple sets. So I find typically two to four working sets to be a good range. Two is like if I was dialed in right away, and absolutely crush the muscle, and I believe a third is just kind of like beating a dead horse, like the muscle's already dead, then I just move on. If I can't get enough stress by the fourth one, I just stop and kind of write down my notes, what weight I used, what reps I used, and then I'll just come back the next time and try to be more aggressive with it and keep it down more towards two or three working sets. Now that's, again, just a general rule of thumb. Typically, whenever you're wanting to figure out how many challenging working sets you should do for a muscle group, Typically, per week, it should be 10 to 20 working sets. That doesn't count warm-ups, but 10 to 20 hard sets per week 
is usually a kind of like a sweet spot for growth. It all depends on the person and how much uh, they were able to recruit mentally with muscle fibers. You know, the more experienced lifter you are, the less volume you actually need. Uh, the less experienced you are, the more volume you need. So 10 to 20 hard, challenging sets. They don't have to be to all-out failure, just at least, um, you know, a rep or two short of all-out failure. But that would be a good volume per week per muscle group. So you can see here I'm moving on to my warm-up sets for leg press. So this is our rogue unilateral leg press. I broke my leg when I was an infant, and my right leg is a little shorter in the femur than my left leg. So I really appreciate and uh, value a machine such as this. You'll see my right leg is a little bit lagging or a little bit different than my left, uh, especially when I get fatigued, and that's going to be partially due to uh, the different in length, difference in length. So in this position, what I'm looking for is a low foot plate angle, and you'll see once I change the uh, view in the next uh, working set or next warm-up set, is a low angle and relatively narrow. This is narrow for me at least. So this is again going to work to hit the outer quads. I have torn my outer quads actually in the past, uh, trying really heavy squats on both sides. So I'm really working to rebuild the tissues in those areas. So I do a lot of uh, quad-focused uh, work. So that's going to be a big thing is getting your feet down and narrow if you want to build that quad sweep. And then also trying not to bounce out of the bottom. So I'm trying not to like extend my stomach and push with my ab wall. I'm trying not to just drop and bounce out of the bottom. I actually want to drive out of the bottom through a quad flex. Like I'm trying to literally just flex my quads as hard as I can. You can see here again, just a good position from above. Uh, I'm keeping my knees kind of not out, but I'm making sure I'm preventing my knees from caving inward. So when you do a leg press, you want your knees to almost come out towards your shoulders as you come down. And that way it ensures that you get the outer quad loaded well. If your knees were to cave inward uh, towards each other, you're going to get more of that teardrop on the inside of the knee. Now, if that's what you want, great. <laughs> but if you want quad sweep, you do want to think of, as you lower down, think of taking your knees and rotating them out towards your shoulders. Okay, so that was the warm-ups and the first working set for leg press. I was doing 20 reps. I'm going to catch uh, one more set of 20 reps and probably add a little more weight and aim for somewhere between... 10 to 14 reps for two working sets. So no special techniques on this one, just straight sets and trying to manage being out of breath and my legs cramping in between the sets. But that's a good thing, challenging the body, not only for muscle development, but also aerobic recovery rate. So that's the idea for leg press today, two working sets of 20 reps, then two working sets of 10 to 14 reps. Okay, let's get ready for the second set of 20. Okay, so you'd hear there I was saying, um, you know, what the goal is for this uh, exercise is just straight sets. So I'm doing two sets of the higher volume, 16 to 20 reps, and then two sets of 10 to 14 reps. So due to the weight load, I know it doesn't look like a lot, but this machine is um, loaded very challengingly. So this is a heavy enough weight load, especially for 16 to 20 reps, to definitely cause some muscle tissue stress and damage. So just straight sets are fine, don't need a special technique. And again, I'm trying not to use momentum. I'm controlling the motion up and down, not allowing the bounce out of the bottom. I'm making sure that I'm flexing and driving through my quads to get the weight to go. So it's more important about quality than just trying to hammer through a bunch of weight and reps. And you can see there, the recovery, uh, pretty painful. During the workout to help manage uh, hydration cramps, I drink uh, a little bit of Gatorade. So I use Gatorade powder and water. And I'll drink a, probably about two or three of these. They're around a half a liter. So I'll probably get about a liter, liter and a half of watered down Gatorade, about 10 to 15 grams of sugar per half liter. So that'd be 30 to 45 ish grams of sugar throughout the workout. And then usually in the middle of the workout, I start drinking some type of whey protein. So this is uh, Muscle Meds Carnivore. I like it because it's not uh, lactose, it's a beef isolate, so a little easier for digestion for me. And it's just straight uh, 
way. There's no carbs, no fat in there, pretty much. So that's what I drink during the workout to help with hydration, recovery between sets, and then also starting to get recovery and muscle building uh, towards the second half and end of the workout. Okay, back to leg press. Okay, so you can hear a little bit about nutrition. So I do have my master's in nutrition, and uh, what I did, my big project uh, that was part of the master's, was a 50-page paper, 200-peer-reviewed research article on the anabolic window, so protein absorption post-workout. And one of the big takeaways is the importance and benefit of intra-workout drinks uh, to make sure that there's sufficient protein in your bloodstream actually as you go through the workout so you don't actually end the workout as uh, emptied out of resources. So it really helps to make sure you get better impact from your training, better progress, and better recovery. So I'm a big believer in intra-workout drinks. So I do use, as you can see there, uh, watered down Gatorade, a little bit of glucose, a little bit of energy. So that way I keep my um, blood sugars from dropping, keep my energy good so I can maximize my performance. And then I do drink uh, whey protein as I get towards the middle and end of the workout to start getting the proteins into the bloodstream to help start to manage some of the repairs and growth factor components um, within the recovery part. So big believer in that. It also helps to then lessen how many calories you need post-training, which helps better control uh, body fat formation post-training. Okay, and then I uh, moved on to doing some belt squats. I mean belt squat uh, calf raises. So the idea of this, and you'll hear me talk about it in a second, is just to let myself catch up a little bit. So from the hard sets of leg press, I was feeling kind of sick, uh, just exhausted, tired. And before moving on to a another kind of compound or challenging movement, I decided to do some calf raises to give myself something purposeful to do, but give my system time to recover a little bit so I could give better attention and effort into that next movement. So for this, I'm doing 10 repetitions and then a 10 second stretch. A really good way just to tick off the calves is doing a stretch once they're pumped. And uh, it, it's a great, great, great technique. It also improves squat mobility and a bunch of other like hip mechanics to make sure your calves aren't tight. So adding in stretches along with contractions is very helpful uh, for, for many reasons. Okay, so I made it through the working sets of leg press. I feel like crap. So I'm going to do some uh, calf raises on our belt squat here. Catch my breath a little bit, then I'll think of a, a good finishing movement that's going to be glute based. So we'll see what I'm in the mood for after this. So the next thing you'll see are the working sets of calf raises. Okay, so you can see I'm back at it. A little bit of a better view here. So you can see I'm actually angling my toes in just a little bit and I'm pushing through my big toe. And this is going to help me contract and really emphasize the outer calf. So if you are wanting to target your outer calf muscle, pigeon toes, toeing your, like, angling your toes inward a little bit helps, as well as pushing through your big toe. That will help you get more stress on those outside fibers. If you were to flare your toes outward, that hits more of the inside edge of the gastrocnemius, the big calf muscle you can see. So... That's a nice little trick. I think aesthetically it looks really good to have the outer quads well-developed. I mean, outer calves well-developed. So I do the majority of my work with a, a pigeon-toed kind of narrow position. So you'll see during the calf raises, I like to, uh, to angle my toes inward a little bit with a little bit of a narrower stance. That hits the outside of the calves, which looks really nice. And then I also leave my knees slightly bent the whole time I'm doing the contractions and then I'll straighten my knees and do like in a stretched position for about 10 seconds. Now I do this different every time I do it but what you'll see today is 10 repetitions of contractions and then a 10 count eccentric. So leave your knees slightly bent, angle your toes inward, push through your big toe during the contractions and then during the stretch straighten your knees and then just try to hold on with your toes but really let that calf muscle Pull open. I'm going to be doing three working sets of this and then we move on to the next exercise. Okay, yep, you can hear that description. And then this is a good view to kind of see a little bit of the balance between the inside and the outside of the calves. So I'm wearing kind of baggy shorts here today so you can't see the top of the calf, but you can still see the contraction 
and you can see there's definitely a good defined line uh, and I'm really trying to get those outer calves grown. Uh, I tore my right ankle when I was in college playing basketball. I tore the three ligaments on the outside of the ankle. So these are also very helpful for creating ankle stability by building and strengthening the calf muscle and especially on that outside portion. So that's a, another kind of motivator for me for why I end up typically choosing that pigeon-toed narrower stance. Okay, so that's the good stretch there. Now, this exercise is a little bit weird looking, but we have an adjustable 45 degree hyperextension bench. It can actually adjust from straight up all the way to like horizontal. And I took a round pad that would typically be seen on a GHD and use some shorty bands to connect that. that. That pad elevation gives me a chance to create some bend in my knee, which then decreases the stretch tension on the hamstrings down by the knee joint so I can better focus on the hamstrings and glutes at the top, at uh, the hip joint. So creating that little bit of a bend and then locking that knee joint into place, making sure I'm not bending and kind of changing the position of that knee joint, it helps me get the hamstring connectors up uh, at the hip end and get a better stress in them. So this is a great exercise uh, for hamstring strength, especially at the hip end, build your glutes. You can also work on uh, actually stretching the hamstrings, like making sure they're not as tight between workouts because uh, with the weight of my upper body in that plate that I'm holding, it really pulls that upper end of the hamstring open by maintaining that flat, neutral lower back. So this is really good uh, for between workouts, making sure that your glutes and hamstrings don't get too tight, which could cause lower back annoyance. So this is really good for hamstring growth, glute growth. Um, this is actually one of my favorite exercises to build conventional deadlift strength. So that's a, a super big benefit from that as well. So I decided to finish up on our adjustable, uh, it's like a 45 degree hyperextension bench, but you can change it anywhere from like vertical all the way to flat. So I put on a rolling pad, like a round pad, to make it more of like a GHD feel. So I'll be able to bend my knees a little bit, release some stretch tension on the hamstrings to get more glute involvement. And then I'm holding that weight plate down there for just extra resistance. So I'll try for sets of five to 10 with the plate and let go of the plate in a couple more reps. So we'll see what that looks like. I like this finisher because it's aggressive on the hamstrings and glutes, but not on my lower back. So that way my lower back isn't exhausted for the second leg day of the week. Okay, three sets, five to 10 with the plate, and then drop for a burnout. Okay, and you can see there I was talking about the uh, technique with this, I was doing a drop set here. And again, this kind of fits the mold as it's, it's more isolative, therefore we're adding some type of technique to get a little extra stress load. Now, um, if this is a new movement to you, the movement itself would be stressful. <laughs> so sometimes if you're new to certain movements, you can just let that be the stimulus. So often when adding in intensity techniques like rest, pause, drop sets and things, you don't have to actually add them every week. You, know, you can go through the first week of a program with everything kind of normal. And then the second week, maybe you add, you know, one um, set of rest pause. Third week, you add a, a two sets of rest pause. Then the fourth week, maybe you do all three working sets with rest pause. So you can really play with uh, when to implement intensity techniques and, you know, do you do double rest pauses, single rest pauses, do you drop sets? There's a lot of learning to it and a lot of just creativity. You know, trying to find what feels like it works best for you in regards to stressing the muscle tissue, but not having you feel uh, inadequate recovery between workouts or that you're involving too many other muscles trying to still get these repetitions in, but maybe the quality is no longer any good. So there's a lot of fun, a lot of play that you get to do with that. Like all my clients, when I write their programming, we have blended uses of intensity techniques and sometimes they're in sometimes they're not depends on what other exercises they're doing in the workouts so everything's written unique for them which is fun okay so that was today's leg workout uh it was amazing awful all the good things all the bad things uh in terms of the good bad things so we did leg extensions our technique for that was the multiple rest pause 10 five fives 
Then we did line single leg hamstring curls. For that one, we did the drop set at 555. Then I did heavy leg presses, two sets of 20, which is kind of like 16 to 20 reps is what I aimed for. Then two sets of 10 to 14 reps. Did the calf raises on the belt squat, standing variation of calf raises to let myself catch my breath. And then I finished with that modified GHD kind of glute raise, 45 degree glute raise. So super fun, really good workout. This is very common of what I do with my first leg workout of the week. It's typically a blend. If I had to err on the side of hamstrings versus quads, it would probably be more quads. And then the second leg workout of the week, I do a blend, but probably err more on the side of hamstrings. And then that also changes. You know, some weeks, if I have a crazy schedule, I'll just do more total working sets and only train legs once, rather than um, kind of two separated workouts. Really just playing it by ear each week. And then anytime I repeat movements, I do progress in weight load or volume to make sure I continue to push my body to adapt and grow new tissue and adapt, you know, cardiovascularly, recovery-wise, just something awful each time I do it. So that way my body continues to develop and grow. So I thought that would be fun to share the workout and then talk a little bit along the way. We're going to be producing a lot more content on our website. One of the things I want to do is give programming specific to the way that I train. So look for that on our website. It's going to be called Live Monthly Programming. And I'll just share what my program is each month. And everybody can kind of follow along. All the exercises will have tutorials with them. And you can just follow along, do it yourself, ask any questions. Remember, our podcast is totally free. You can ask any questions, and I'll answer that uh, those questions in the podcast. So check us out on our website, www.brewlearnedgym.com. Find us on Instagram. Find us on YouTube. Follow us if you do there. And then also subscribe and listen to our podcast. Hopefully this was helpful. If you like these kind of videos, let me know, and then I'll continue to make more. I appreciate you watching. Thank you very much.